From the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews, and A-list guests. And I guarantee you, no spin, no bias, no censorship, and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wharton tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello and welcome to The Briefing with me, Gloria De Piero. As the war in Ukraine escalates further, we'll bring you the latest on the ground in Poland as Ukrainians flee for their lives. I'll be talking with David Davis MP. He's calling for a fast clampdown on Russian oligarchs. I'll have the Labour view from the Shadow Peace Minister. Plus, we're talking about babies in the House of Commons Chamber. Is it OK to take your baby with you to work if you're an MP? That is all after the news with Rosie. A very good afternoon. It's 12 o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Ukraine's Deputy Prime Minister says the humanitarian corridors that were designed to allow civilians to flee cities besieged by Russia are still not open. Inya Verashuk says there are nearly 300,000 civilians requiring evacuation from the city of Maripol alone. Russia said the corridors would be introduced from the city, along with Kyiv, Kharkiv and Sumy, However, most of these routes only allow refugees to head to Russia and Belarus. Now, this is a move Ukraine has described as completely immoral. Previous attempts to introduce corridors have failed, with civilians coming under fire despite ceasefire agreements. The Ukrainian president has accused Russian forces of deliberate murder. What's needed is a boycott of Russian exports, in particular the rejection of oil and its products from Russia. It can be called an embargo or just morality, like when you refuse to give money to a terrorist. Boycott Russian imports. If they don't want to comply with civilised rules, they should not receive goods and services from civilization either. Let the war feed them. The UK Home Secretary Priti Patel said that over 10,000 people have applied for the UK's Ukraine Family Scheme since it was launched on Friday. Well, the Home Office say around 50 visas have been granted as of Sunday morning. The United Nations estimates that more than one and a half million refugees have crossed into neighbouring countries since the start of the invasion. Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds told GB News more needs to be done to support those families. What is clearly required is an emergency protection visa that sweeps away a lot of the bureaucracy you reasonably have behind a normal visa request that recognises the emergency situation that people are in. I think you need some way to know who's coming to this country because I think in, in the past that hasn't been done particularly well and these are people who will need support, especially children who fled a war zone. The UK has allocated a further £74 million to the Ukrainian government's budget to help with the humanitarian crisis on the ground. More than £100 million has been raised by the UK public in aid for Ukrainians. The Disasters Emergency Committee said that's the equivalent of more than a £1 million given an hour since the appeal was launched. Boris Johnson is going to host the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte today at Downing Street. Now, it's part of a week of diplomatic talks aiming to build a united front against Vladimir Putin. On Tuesday, Boris Johnson will host the leaders of Poland, Slovakia, Hungary and the Czech Republic. The government's economic crime bill, which partly aims to tackle Russian money in the UK, is due to be debated by MPs today. Labour says, though, the government is giving Russian oligarchs too long to register their UK properties, saying the time limit should be moved from six months to instead 28 days. Former intelligence analyst Ewan Grant told us that oligarchs only actually need days to prove ownership of properties. I have to say, I think the Labour proposal is valid because remember these people don't have to look in the back cupboard for the paperwork they've got their lawyers and accountants to do that for them they can provide the evidence of ownership and source of funds within days if they want to the U.S. is exploring legislation to further isolate Russia from the global economy. That includes the idea of banning the import of its oil and energy products into the country. It has now a growing number of organisations have terminated relationships with Moscow over their invasion. American Express, Netflix, KPMG, PricewaterhouseCoopers, for example, have all announced they'll no longer operate in Russia. 
social media platform TikTok has blocked its Russian users from posting new videos. Average petrol prices have risen to a record £1.55 per litre. That's according to the data firm Experian Catalyst. Well, it's due to concerns over the reliability of supplies amid the war in Ukraine. The price of diesel is also at a record high. Briefly in other news now, a new code of practice in the UK is aiming to stop universities from offering students unconditional places to study there if they make that university their first choice. Universities UK published its code of practice on fair admissions following an 18-month review. The code advises universities should only use unconditional offers in very limited circumstances, for example, where admissions are informed by interviews or auditions. Around 90,000 children in England have had lessons to brush up on their speech skills following concerns they'd suffered due to COVID. More than two-thirds of primary schools have signed up for targeted language support since August 2020. The sessions are delivered over 20 weeks with trained teachers to provide either individual support or that in small groups. Experts are asking NHS England to prove that scrapping the four-hour A&E waiting time target will actually improve patient care. Well, it's going to be replaced by new average wait times with patients being seen within 15 minutes of arriving at A&E for initial assessment. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine, Nuffield Trust and King's Fund have all expressed concern that data from pilot studies hasn't been made public. You're now up to date on GB News. I'll bring you any more developments as it happens. Now let's head to the lunchtime briefing with Gloria. Coming up this hour on the briefing, as the Ukraine war gets even more brutal, over one and a half million people have now fled in fear of their lives. We're live near the border in Poland. The need to clamp down on dirty Russian money has never been greater. Conservative MP David Davis is calling for tougher action in today's economic crime bill. He'll be talking to me shortly. And also, I'll be talking to Shadow Peace Minister Fabian Hamilton about what more the West can do. And is it okay to take your baby to work if you're an MP? Several, some MPs were not impressed when Labour MP Stella Creasy took her baby into the Commons Chamber. She'll be telling us why it matters. As life in Ukraine becomes more and more difficult, desperate people flee for safety into neighbouring countries. Over one and a half million have left their homeland and many of them are now in Poland. Our reporter, Paul Hawkins, is at the train station in Helm in Poland. Paul, what can you tell us? Yeah, hi, Gloria. Uh, yeah, we're at the uh, station in Helm. We're about 20 kilometres from the border. We were told by a German volunteer at the refugee registration centre in the town earlier that um, they've actually moved the border here. So, um, so, so that's effectively where um, the border is now here. And as you can see behind me, these guys on the desks here, that is passport control. So the people there uh, at the moment, that they're, they're waiting for a train. We're told that there's a train coming in in the next couple of uh, minutes, at, uh, coming in from Lviv, which of course is a city in the, uh, in the west of the country. Uh, and that is where... Uh, at the moment, uh, there is no Russian presence in the west of the country, but of course, as uh, the Russians move uh, west in, uh, well, well, I mean, at the moment, they're, they're besieging a lot of the uh, capitals, in, a lot of the cities in Ukraine, but uh, once they start moving west, there is a worry that uh, a lot more people uh, are going to come over the border. And in fact, I was speaking to one volunteer here who told me that every other bed in Helm is uh, filled with a Ukrainian, every other house, sorry, uh, in Ukraine is filled with, the, with uh, and she was saying to me, we simply don't know where we're going to put all these people. That's not, it's not because they don't care, but it's simply a question of logistics. And you can understand why the Ukrainians want to stay in Poland. They just want to stay as close as they can to home so that when the war is over, um, they will be able to return home rather than going all the way to Germany uh, or going all the way to France. But it's, it's, so it's a question of what, 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 but then again, it's a question of what you want against what you need and they need somewhere to stay and homes are filling up quickly in Poland. Paul Hawkins, thanks so much for that report. Thank you. Now, over the weekend, we saw horrendous images as civilians trying to flee through the supposed 
safe passages around the town of Irpin were attacked just outside Kyiv. Overnight on Sunday, Russia sent a letter proposing a temporary ceasefire. The Ukrainian government see these routes as unacceptable as they lead to Russia or Belarus. Joining me now is Labour MP and Shadow Peace Minister Fabian Hamilton. Fabian, good to see you. You're the Shadow Minister for Peace. Your assessment of the chances yes, of your, your assessment of the chances of seeing peace in Ukraine. Sadly, very limited uh, at the moment. There seems to be no a way out to save face for the Russian leader, Vladimir Putin. Um, and the question, I think, in my mind and the minds of very many Ukrainians, as well as uh, the rest of us around the world, is how can uh, Putin safely withdraw and shut down this war, which is not going his way, uh, without losing face, without uh, appearing uh, to do a, a, an about turn? Uh, and without without actually making himself look a fool for telling the world that this was a war against fascism and Nazism, uh, this was the West trying to impose its will uh, up Ukraine, a former Soviet satellite. Uh, how can there be a withdrawal with the saving of, of face? And of course, we need that to save lives. That's the most important thing right now. What's the best way of bringing that about? Well, it, it seems to me that the, the, the economic means are very important. Uh, the military uh, experts tell us that to occupy Ukraine without the kind of resistance the Ukrainians are currently offering and will offer if they're fully occupied will take at least 350,000 troops. That costs a fortune, always assuming those troops are willing to do uh, what they're commanded to do. And morale, we're told, is extremely low. I think that we need to pursue the economic sanctions even more fully. I think my colleagues on the Labour front bench are absolutely right that we can't be waiting six months for the oligarchs uh, to register. We have to give them 28 days. And I think that's backed up by a lot of expert evidence uh, as well. The, the fact is, the economy of Russia is now smaller than the economy of Spain. Now, of course, the increase in oil prices and gas prices is going to help give them some liquidity. But the fact is that in the end, I think it will be the economy that squeezes Russia and makes this war totally unaffordable because they're going to be cut off from the entire world global financial community, as well as economic trade uh, and, and, and uh, social and sporting and cultural issues. That's not good for the Russian people. Uh, and, and I hope that that means that many, many Russians continue putting their lives in jeopardy by demonstrating against their own government and saying, this war is not in our name. And that will all further add to the pressure on Putin. But let's face it, uh, Gloria, he is like a czar. Uh, his word goes. He's an absolute supreme ruler in that country without any challenge. Uh, and the question is, how far can he go with his own people, as well as the slaughter in Ukraine, before somebody stops him, whether it's at home or abroad. You talk about economic sanctions. The Prime Minister is rushing through new legislation today. He says, we will ramp up the pressure on those criminal elites trying to launder money on UK soil and close the net on corruption. Those oligarchs will have nowhere to hide. Why isn't that enough for the Labour Party? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's, it's, a very good, it's a very good start and it's a very good thing to do. But in the end, what we need to make sure is that those oligarchs, as well as uh, the ordinary Russian population, are so appalled. The price they're paying is so high. And, you know, I hate to see ordinary people have to pay a price for one man's folly. Well, he's evil, let's put it, let's put it bluntly. Uh, so I think as far as we're concerned in the Labour Party, uh, yeah, we support the government in what they're doing, but we want them to go a lot further. And we want a far more visas to be issued to uh, the, the, the refugees that are desperate to come to any safe part of Europe. 50 visas is not good enough. Let's ramp that up too. I know constituents in my own Leeds Northeast constituency who want to give bedrooms and, and half their households to uh, refugees coming from Ukraine. Because the one thing we know is that when there is once again peace restored uh, in Ukraine, when they're able to be a nation state again, those people will want to go home. They are fiercely supportive of their own nationality, their own country, and they want to support that country, but they're not prepared to, be, to, be, to see their families murdered in this appalling way. So we need to do as much as we possibly can as a British government, as the British state, not just to welcome refugees, but to ensure that the pressure is piled on to Putin uh, and his megalomaniac 
project to flatten Ukraine and kill as many innocent civilians as possible. This has to stop and it has to stop right now. The government has already increased its visa offer to refugees from the Ukraine. And the Home Secretary says she's doing everything possible to speed up efforts to issue the travel permits. The government are doing their best. Well, I don't think they are doing the best, Gloria. Um, you know, there are dissenting voices in their own party saying uh, we've done enough. After all, we don't need to uh, uh, we don't need to welcome any refugees here into the United Kingdom. I'm sorry, that's nonsense. The British people are way ahead of uh, certain members of the governing party who, who think we've done enough. We haven't done enough. And actually, 50 visas so far, compare that with Poland or Romania or Germany or any of the other countries that are far closer to the front line there. Uh, we are not doing enough. We need to do more. We need to welcome more people here. Uh, we need to pile that pressure on, as I say. Uh, and what we've done so far is good, but let's keep on going until this slaughter stops. That's what we have to aim for. Labour's Fabian Hamilton, Shadow Peace Minister, thanks very much indeed for talking to us no, today. Please. Thank you. Coming up. In just a moment, I'll be talking with Conservative MP and former Brexit Secretary David Davis. He's added an amendment to the Economic Crime Bill, uh, which is going through the Commons later today. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV, where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello. A cold but largely sunny start to the working week. Much of the country dry today. We will see weather fronts eventually bringing some patchy rain to parts of the west tomorrow. But they're making slow progress, these weather fronts, up against this chunky area of high pressure, bringing, by and large, the whole of the country a dry day today. We have seen one or two showers drifting over East Anglia into the East Midlands. Still one or two around here through the early afternoon, but fizzling out. A cloudier zone over parts of northern England, north Wales, but uh, for most, dry, fine, with plenty of blue sky. There is a fairly brisk wind blowing, though, across the south. That is bringing a fairly chilly feel once more. Temperatures widely mid to high single figures, so cold for the time of year. But add on that wind and it feels quite a bit colder across much of southern England in particular. And it'll turn quite cold overnight tonight. We'll keep some cloud across the uh, east and maybe one or two showers just grazing into Cornwall. But the vast majority dry and as skies start to clear later in the night, so that blue on the map is a, a frost forming, certainly across the spine of the country. A bit too much breeze to have too much frost across the east and a bit more cloud further west, keeping temperatures up here. But for many, it'll be a cold, frosty start to Tuesday, a windier day as well. 
Again, much of central and eastern England, most of Scotland looking dry and sunny, but steadily clouding over from the west with some patchy rain by the end of the day into Northern Ireland, West Wales and southwest England too. But much of the day will be dry, certainly across the east, plenty of sunshine, but um, temperatures again, only single figures here. Further west, it is turning milder, but of course you'll have the cloud and we will have some outbreaks of rain, which will just continue to trickle a little further eastwards as we go through Tuesday evening before that band of rain, that weather front fizzles out. There is another one waiting to push in slowly but surely as we head into Wednesday. That will bring some rain to Scotland and Northern Ireland. Much of the week there will be dry across the east and after a cold start, things slowly turning a bit milder. After a horrific weekend of civilian deaths during so-called ceasefires that were anything but, the West is working urgently on further help for Ukraine. Today's long-awaited economic crime bill aims to clamp down on dirty Russian money, but many think it doesn't go far enough. David Davis, former Brexit Secretary, has put forward an amendment to the bill, and I'm delighted he joins me now in the studio. The government are rushing through new laws to make quicker sanctions possible as quickly as possible. Why is that not good enough for you? Well, the, first you've got to do uh, the, the Russian, uh, the, the Russians, the, the, the government are doing it as fast as they can. And of course, you know, from your own time in Parliament, the faster the government does something, the worse the job it makes of it, I'm afraid. Uh, and so it's not a perfect bill by a long measure. There are two types of sanctions. There are sanctions against the Russian state, in effect, and the sanctions against the oligarchs. My worry is that by the time we get down round to bringing these sanctions into play against the oligarchs, they'll, they'll have all, the ones who are actually guilty of anything will have moved all their yachts, their, their cash, their, their assets, and they'll have sold off the ones they can't move, whether it's, whether it's uh, uh, flats or football teams. You know. So, so uh, what I've said is, look, let's name all the ones we're looking at. You know, they're not necessarily guilty, they're just people that are being looked at. And for the interim period, just say to them, you can't sell off your assets, you can't move them outside the jurisdiction, you can't transfer them to other people, just for however long it takes, probably six months. You know, it's not a great imposition. It's a bit like, it's a bit like frankly, being on bail when you're, when you're before trial. You can't run away. Well, this is ensuring your assets can't run away. Otherwise, we're going to make them be made to look fools. I mean, the simple truth is that they'll all have moved their, moved their assets. So the ones we're trying to focus in on will we'll find there's nothing to do. You're a very influential Commons figure. What are the chances of you getting the amendment that you've just defined? Oh, I, th I, th I think uh, moderately good. I mean, if not, if not at the common stage, the Lord stage, because we've got two stages. Tomorrow we've got the Lords. And, um, uh, and the truth of the matter is that the ministers actually are bending over backwards to be as helpful as they can. I mean, for a variety of reasons. Number one, we are maintaining an extraordinary unity in the Commons. I mean, you know, even, even Keir Starmer yesterday said he wasn't going to call for Boris to resign whilst this was going on. Um, so, so, you know, all sorts of things are being done to that end to maintain national unity. Secondly, the government doesn't want to be sitting there saying, we're doing everything possible, and people like me and other people in the Commons saying, no, you're not, you should have done this. You know, they, they want to maintain the moral high ground, if you like. So for lots and lots of reasons, and actually the junior ministers on this are pretty reasonable people. I mean, Paul Scully and Damien Hind, they're, they're, they're good people. So, so I think we've got a decent chance. But, you know, it's a very strong argument to be had. You talk about how important national unity is. Uh, what do you say to the suggestion that the government could make that actually you, you're, you're damaging national unity by saying they're not going far enough and, and, and seeking to put these amendments down? Well, what I am? Oh, well, no, I don't think so. This is the House of Commons. We're there to debate things. We're there to make the government do a better job. I mean, one of the things that's been noticeable through the COVID two years uh, is that actually the quality of government decisions has been poorer than it would have been had ministers had to come to the House and defend what they were deciding and actually think it through properly. I mean, you'll know from your own days, ministers, when they're going to come to the House of Commons, the civil service all pile in to get it exactly right because they don't want people like me or you in the, in the day, back in the day, uh, to pull them apart. They want to get it right. And so the, the actual operation of the Commons is good for the outcome, and that's what we want. we want. We want, at the end of the day, to make it impossible for the Russian establishment to maintain this war. That's what we want to do. Um, that's, you know, 
punishment, you can feel good about punishing people, but actually it's about stopping what's going on. It's about stopping the killing of innocent people. And uh, if we can do that better by uh, one or two amendments, fine. Actually, there are about 30 pages of government yeah. amendments down, in truth. So plenty of people. And everybody's treating it uh, constructively. You praised uh, Keir Starmer for not calling on the Prime Minister mm. to go in the current circumstances because he had done during all the Partygate yeah. affair. Yeah. Wasn't the only one calling for him to go? No, it wasn't, and I'm taking the same rule. <laughs> You're taking the same rule? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you regret calling for him to no, go? No, no, no. But, I, did but... what, I did what needed to be done. OK, let's have a look at the criticisms that the government is facing over refugees. Mm -hmm. Just 50 visas granted. Labour say that is shameful. They say the government should send Home Office officials to set up an emergency centre in Calais and provide emergency protection visas. Well, the first thing to say is I think uh, Priti Patel, who's normally very tough on immigration, has actually said that she's going to take hold of this issue personally and sort it out. So that's quite a big signal straight away. But there's also something else that we should, we should be conscious of. Look, these are going to be predominantly women and children. The young men are being kept uh, uh, to fight the war, you know. It's women and children and very old men. That's, that's who it'll be. And what that means we've got to worry about housing, education, social support and so on. So we've got to do it right. I mean, it's not just a question of numbers and headlines in, in tabloid newspapers. It's a question of getting it right. And I actually asked um, Pretty uh, last week at the last... Uh, statement in the House, I think. Um, you know, are we talking to the other Europeans? Are we sorting out how many we're going to take? Because we're looking at... I, I mean, I would not be surprised if we end up with five million refugees coming out of uh, coming out of Ukraine, maybe more. It's already well over a million. And our fair share of that is probably half a million, you know, or thereabouts, or north of half a million. Um, now, with that, that's, that's a lot of people to take on board. That's a lot of houses to find. That's a lot of school places to fill. And we've got to get that right. So I think there's a bit more to it than just numbers. Um, I can, you know, I'm, I've got entire sympathy with it. 50 is not enough. It certainly isn't. But the, but the simple truth is, Pretty's on top of that. But she's got to do more than just say, oh, we'll have all these numbers. She's got to say how we're going to deal with it too. And it's true, not just for us. And the comparison that was being made on that was made on your programme, was made on other programmes earlier. Oh, well, this is much less than, than Poland mm. and Romania. Well, they're right on the doorstep. Of course it's much less than them. I mean, it will probably always be much less than them because if I were a Ukrainian, I wouldn't want to go 1,000 miles. I want to go 50 miles and I hope I can get back quickly. So, uh, but nevertheless, we have to prepare for hundreds, hundreds, many hundreds probably, of thousands of people uh, coming here, and that's more than just signing a bit of paper. There's a lot of preparation that goes into that. You've talked about, and you're going to be talking in the House of Commons, about how to clamp down on oligarchs. Mm. Should Evgeny Lebedev, should he have been made a lord, in your yeah. view? I don't, I don't know much about Evgeny. Um, I, don't know what, I don't know what the nomination was. Normally there's a reason for a nomination, whether it's charitable contributions or whatever. What I would say is, as a general principle, that you know, if you come from Russia uh, and you've made, or your father has made, or your family, however it's done, uh, uh, was an important part of the Russian state, in the case of his father, a KGB officer, and was, uh, and then made a, a billion dollars or whatever, or something of that order, during this sort of era immediately after Yeltsin, or during Yeltsin immediately afterwards, there's an instant suspicion about this. You know, is, is this clean money? Is this legitimate? You know, uh, I, mean, I, I have my doubts about the whole gold visa policy in the first place, you know, uh, which dates right back to, to the late 90s and early thousands. Um, then I think, you know, there probably has to be a slightly higher bar to cross. Uh, for that. So I don't know the details of Evgeny, I'm afraid, but I think I, if, I were, if I were on the House of Lords Commission, I'd be saying, well, the bar for somebody with that background is a little bit higher. OK. <laughs> yeah. And of course, number, number 10 say all appointments are vetted by the House of Lords mm. appointment system. David Davis, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, My we're, we were really pleased when we heard that you were available. So thank you. Thank you. Informative, informative as ever. Yeah. After the news, I have a real me interview with Conservative MP Marco Longhi and Labour MP Stella Creasy tells me why she should be allowed to take her baby into the House of Commons chamber. That's after the news.
Good afternoon, it's half past 12. I'm Rosie Wright, here to keep you up to date on GB News. Now, Boris Johnson says thousands of visa applications from Ukrainians fleeing the war are being processed in the UK. He says the UK will have a system that is as generous as it can possibly be, but there will be checks on who is coming in. Putin is doubling down on his aggression uh, and he is deciding to attack in a pretty indiscriminate way. That's producing huge waves of, of people. We're going to have to respond to that and we will. We've always been very generous in the way we respond to uh, people fleeing uh, war zones and no country in Europe has done more to settle vulnerable people uh, since 2015 th than the UK. Speaking shortly after meeting the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and the Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte at RAF Northolt in London, Boris Johnson also said the UK wants to go as fast as possible in imposing further sanctions. He, however, added that this must not turn into a witch hunt against every Russian in the UK, saying the UK is not anti-Russian. Ukraine's deputy prime minister says humanitarian corridors supposed to allow civilians to flee cities besieged by Russia are still not open. Russia said the corridors would be introduced from the city Maripol, Kyiv, Kharkiv and Sumy. However, most routes only allow refugees to then head to Russia and Belarus. Ukraine has described the move as completely immoral. The UK has allocated a further £74 million to the Ukrainian government's budget to help with the humanitarian crisis on the ground. More than £100 million has also been raised in aid for Ukrainians by the UK public. Average petrol prices have risen to a record £1.55 per litre. Diesel is also at a record high of £161.28. It's due to concerns over the reliability of supplies amid the war in Ukraine. You're now up to date here on GB News. We're on your TV online and your DAB Plus radio. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back with the briefing shortly. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate. From all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories. Make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel. Right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Welcome back. It's time for my latest Real Me interview. Marco Longhi, Conservative MP for Dully North, tells me about growing up, why he's not a big fan of politicians' WhatsApp groups. And just to let you know, this interview was recorded before Russia invaded Ukraine. Marco Longhi, buongiorno. Gloria, buongiorno. Come stai? <laughs> 
Stabena, but my Italian runs out fairly quickly after that. That's fine. How, how is your Italian? Uh, I'd like to think it's still fluent, but it, there is a case of use it or lose it. So uh, I'm very happy when my father comes around to say hi because I just switch over and it just reminds me, keep the cogs turning. So I grew up Italian, yeah. but in Bradford, you grew okay. up Italian. In Rome. In Rome. What was it like growing the up? The Eternal time? City. It was brilliant, but of course you don't realise where you are and what you're experiencing when you're still only a child. You were elected in 2019, part of uh, the Red Wall victory. Did you feel at home when you entered Parliament? Did you, did you feel like this was a place where you fitted in or one where you struggled? There are probably several different answers to that question. It, it felt surreal uh, initially. Uh, you probably felt that yourself, Gloria. Um, it felt, um, you know, how, how do I run with this? And it was several weeks that before I even had an office. I was living out of a, a rucksack uh, and being asked to work in the library on a desk. And I didn't have an office uh, in Dudley. And they don't tell you this before you stand for Parliament, that you become an employer and you're responsible for staff uh, and that sort of thing. So I had to find an office, which was all down to me. Parliament doesn't do that for you. And, and employ people. So all of that was uh, quite a big ask at the time. And I, and I think I was one of the early adopters of COVID because I was on my knees health-wise straight after, after the election for probably about two months with very similar symptoms to the ones we describe are those of COVID symptoms. So... Um, Tell me about that. What, when, when were you struck by these symptoms? Just before the election, actually. And at the time, there was talk about this virus, perhaps in China. Oh, no, it's not in the UK, et cetera. Uh, but, yeah, I, I, I think eventually when the full inquiry and the full study is done on COVID, there'll be no doubt PhD students who will do a study on, on, on the whole COVID experience. Uh, I think we'll find that it was in the country a lot sooner than any of us thought of it. If you remember, they were tracking a particular individual who came to the UK and in, in the South, and they thought that was the very first person who had it. I, I, I think it was in the country before then. What but were your symptoms? Very sh uh, short of breath. Uh, mm -hmm. So I stay in the hotel across from Parliament, mm -hmm. just crossing the bridge, breaking into sweats. But that lasted for weeks and weeks. Um, and this is just, and, and, just and after you're elected, symptoms. so sort yeah. of late 2019, and it went into early 2020. I can honestly say it was the beginning of March before I started to feel more like myself. Really? Honestly. Which is when we all learn in a big way. We have COVID and everyone's going into lockdown. <laughs> So that was you, then. Now is now. <laughs> that was, you get this big job. You're obviously feeling really ill, but apart, but I'm really happy at the same time. But really ill. Once you'd got your, did you feel like there's a lot of people like me in here, or did you feel like oh, I feel an outsider in here? Probably more of an outsider, if I'm totally honest. Um, when people talk about the Westminster bubble, the establishment. Uh, the way of doing things. And then I think about Dudley people, Warsaw people, black country people. They are like planets apart. And uh, I want to absolutely stand true because I, I am an elected representative and this is a representative democracy. I want to represent the people who I grew up with, who mean a lot to me, the salt of the earth people who are the black country people and no. Uh, I would have to say a number of the rooms and corridors in Westminster Palace is not representative. So I am part of that change and many other of the 29 intake have brought about that change. And, and I'd like to think the Conservative Party has changed in many ways in that respect. Do you think your intake have been treated with respect by perhaps some of your more establishment colleagues, the more traditional Conservatives? I can speak about my own experience, uh, and there are MPs who've been uh, there some time that you, I would have only ever seen on TV before, uh, who uh, some of them made a point of getting to know me and every other new MP and very friendly and outwardly going, and, and that's great. Others who probably wouldn't even acknowledge you. Uh, and, and I think that's just the way it is, but that's... Mm -hmm. That's cross-party, I guess. I think that's, you know, the 650 MPs, and amongst those, there are 
the more sociable ones and those that are less. Um, but so no, my, my, my experience, but overall, has been a has been a positive one uh, with caveats. There has been a, a reasonable level of feuding in your party. Is that difficult to deal with, not just practically or politically, but psychologically and emotionally? It is difficult for me because um, I realised very early on that if you want to be a mover and shaker and make things happen in politics, you have to decide fairly early on whether you're going to be a team player or not. And one of the things that I find very sad is when I see people who I would otherwise admire uh, really give hostile speeches you know, against the government or especially against Boris Johnson, the prime minister, and, 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 and I, I struggle with that because um, I have to then decide for myself, is this person being self-indulgent? Are they full of their own self-importance? Uh, are they putting themselves ahead of the team effort, uh, which I give a lot of uh, importance to, as I've said before? So I do find that kind of thing very interesting. I'm, I'm sure you remember from your own time, Gloria, that there's all of these WhatsApp groups as well. And, uh, there's literally dozens and dozens and dozens of them, and I'm, um, I'm a little reluctant to play a part in them because I hate it when any impression could be given that there's a party within a party. But what I also realise is that if you want to bring about change and influence amongst senior decision makers, you have to have the ability to have that influence. And sometimes, if you're just standing there alone, um, your one voice. So, I, so there's that tension. Um, there's that tension. There's that tightrope that you you have to walk. And I guess every MP will be judging mm. where they you know, how they walk that rope. And you mentioned the WhatsApp groups. Yeah. How do you feel when some of the contents of those WhatsApp groups end up in newspapers? Well, uh, there was a WhatsApp group created for the new intake, and uh, I was like a keen participant in the beginning, and. Uh, the moment I saw that uh, one of the conversations had made it into the papers, I, I actually left the group. Um, I think I'm, a, I'm only one of the very few who are, who are not part of that group. And one could argue, well, you can be a member and not contribute and just basically see what is happening on there. But I, I just didn't feel comfortable. Um, I remember early on there was a conversation that was being had on one of the health support groups. Health support, as in literally health support or health, health policy? Support. Health, health support, so a WhatsApp group. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I trained as a pilot. I didn't mention this earlier, I suppose, and I know why planes fly, and one of the things I know about them is their oxygen systems. I'd made a comment on there, and I was actually originally thinking about cruise ships, and I remember the SS Canberra that went to the Falklands and acted as a warship, and I thought, why don't we have hospital ships that we can move around uh, the United Kingdom and perhaps even sent to other countries who are perhaps struggling even more than we are. And then I thought, well, we have some big airliners as well that we can fly into different countries. And someone had leaked what I had said in a very sort of placid way. You know, you're a brand new MP, so it's not the big guy. It's certainly not from me anyway. Mm. Um, and they put it on Guido Fawkes. You, you, you must yeah. be aware of it. Yeah. Oh, this, this crazy guy, Marco, saying this, saying that, and who does he think he is? And then... Guido made out I was some sort of idiot. Um, but a few weeks later, Guido apologised to me, and I, I'm told that it's the first time they've ever done that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, they found out, and other countries actually picked up and ran with that idea. Mm. Uh, because it's all about, you know, when you have COVID, the thing that people need the most is oxygen in their systems because the lungs are mm. getting clogged up. And I thought, well, if, it's, if all you need is oxygen, well, on a plane, you've got those oxygen masks, mm. haven't you? And uh, give people extra oxygen. So um, you're right about the number of WhatsApp groups that exist for yeah. MPs. I was a member of lots of them. <laughs> you are a member of some of them, but you have, you, you've left one of them. So can you give any advice to MPs, life is okay without WhatsApp groups? Life is absolutely okay without WhatsApp groups. And, you know, I have a great relationship with my whip. He's, he's absolutely brilliant. Uh, I consider him as much as anything, a friend now uh, and a mentor to me. The whips should be nice to you because you haven't rebelled. And that's quite unusual in the 2019 intake. Any regrets? Um, no personal regrets, 
regrets that maybe things didn't happen a different way. Uh, I, I think I struggled most with, uh, as a parliamentarian, was uh, voting for the increase in national insurance. I'm one of the people who would think that uh, rather than, you know, as a conservative, for me, my ethos is grow the economy and it's through growth rather than stifling growth through taxes that you will bring in more revenue into the coffers uh, for the Chancellor. But if you tax people more, they will spend uh, less. Uh, but you know what? I'm not the Chancellor. We've been through some crazy times. We've borrowed 420 odd billion pounds. As the, you know, the words were, we've wrapped our arms around the country, around people, individuals, businesses, and spent a huge amount of money. Uh, so there was that vote, and then there was the Owen Patterson vote, which I really struggled with, but the way I interpreted it was, um, it's a voting confidence, the Prime Minister. And there is no way I was going to throw my leader. I am a loyalist and I'm, I'm a team player. We all know that the Prime Minister has acknowledged that that wasn't the right decision at the time and okay. subsequently reversed it. And that's it. You move on from there. No fact, one's perfect, Gloria. No one's perfect. Not even politicians. No. <laughs> uh, finally, um, one of your colleagues, parliamentary colleagues, was, was murdered, Sir David Amos. I put a big spotlight onto the security and safety of MPs. So he was one of the MPs that made a point of coming to talk to me. He's been around a long time and we have offices close to each other on the third floor on one Parliament Street, uh, a building I'm sure you're all mm. familiar with. And you go up in the lifts, the lifts door open and they open right in front of his door. And there's been a candle there for several weeks, um, burning away. It's, um, and as a Catholic as well, I, I, I've, I've felt that quite, it's been hard. It's been hard, so. Uh, Has it made you think about your own security and safety? More so for my friends and family than probably for myself. I could see genuine fear in my wife's eyes and my daughters. I have two daughters, 21 and 18. And I was having to persuade them no, it's, it's going to be okay, it's fine, when actually, deep down, I had my own uh, concerns. So we have beefed up security, both at the office uh, in Dudley and then when I go out for surgeries, but I have to keep saying to myself, we can't let these people win. And it is about representative democracy. I need to be seen to be accessible at all times. So I do have someone now who is sitting in the background uh, at my surgery and, you know, that person assesses risk. Um, you know, I used to have pop-up surgeries. I used to advertise mm -hmm. it on Facebook. I'm going to be here, I'm going to be there, I'm going to be there. Please pop by if you can. And I'm being told, I'm being advised, Marco, don't do that. That sounds very sensible to me. I would like to um, say thank you very much. You've been very, very open about your experience of politics. It's been very interesting. And I'd like to end, if my Italian was any good, by saying stay safe in Italian. But my Italian is rubbish. So, non ti preoccupare. Ah, uh, it's not, don't worry, my gosh. Oh, is that don't worry? <laughs> yes. No, I, I want you to worry. I want you to stay safe. <laughs> <laughs> Marco Lunghi, um, it's been a pleasure to talk to you. It's been all my pleasure. Thank you. And you can find a longer version of that interview on YouTube. It was recorded before Russia invaded Ukraine. The Prime Minister has been speaking about the war in Ukraine in the past hour. He was asked about the UK's commitment to helping refugees. Let's have a listen. We're processing thousands as I, uh, as I speak to you. And clearly this, uh, this crisis is evolving the whole time. And I've, I've said before that the UK will be uh, as generous as we can possibly be. And we intend to, to, to do that. We have two very, very generous routes already. So the family reunion route, uh, which is uncapped, which could uh, potentially see hundreds of thousands of people come to this country, plus there's the, the humanitarian route. And under that scheme, people can sponsor people uh, coming from Ukraine. Uh, we're surging uh, officials into the, the border countries to help people to come. So uh, to, to Poland, to Bulgaria, to, to Romania, also to, to France. Uh, and uh, clearly what's happening now is that uh, Putin is doubling down on his aggression uh, and he is deciding to attack in a pretty indiscriminate way. That's producing huge waves of 
of people. We're going to have to respond to that, and we will. We've always been very generous in the way we respond to uh, people fleeing uh, war zones, and no country in Europe has done more to settle vulnerable people uh, since 2015 th than the UK. I can't give you the number. We're processing thousands uh, right now. We will continue to make sure that we have a very, very generous approach. What we, what we want to do, what we want to do... Considering a, a third route, not based on family members, not based on sponsorship, similar to the EU scheme. What we won't do, let me be very clear, what we won't do is have a system where people can come into uh, the UK without any checks or any uh, controls at all. I don't think that is the right approach, uh, but what we will do is have a, a system that is very, very generous. As, as the situation in, in Ukraine deteriorates, people are going to want to see this country uh, open our arms to people fleeing uh, persecution, fleeing a war zone. I think people uh, who have spare rooms, who, uh, who want to uh, receive people coming from Ukraine, will want us to, uh, to have a system that enables them exactly. to do that. Exactly. And, and, that, is, that, and that, is, that is already happening. So, so what we will do is have a very, very generous and uh, an open approach. But what we won't do is simply abandon controls altogether. Now, later today in the House of Commons, the House of Commons Procedure Committee will take evidence from two MPs, both mums with young babies, into whether babies should be allowed in the House of Commons chamber. Last week, the former leader of the House, Andrea Leadsom, told me she was opposed to the change. Joining me now is Stella Creasy, the Labour MP for Walthamstow. Hello, Stella. Uh, lovely to see you. Hey, um, Gloria. <laughs> and, hear, and hear your little one. Can I start? by asking <laughs> what you think about the process this afternoon because when I when I read it I thought gosh that sounds a bit brutal to two, two um, MPs sort of pitted against each other um, I, I, do you feel okay about it uh, no and in fact that's not what's going to happen this afternoon I'm actually giving evidence on Wednesday look I'm very clear there's way too much mum shaming in society anyway and women being told that they can't do right whatever they choose to do I'm not going to criticize another MP for how they choose to do this process so they're taking us separately what I am also going to say Gloria is this is the wrong inquiry to be having because parliaments across the world have different schemes for letting babies in whether it's in New Zealand in Finland in Iceland in Spain Canada whatever the question is, why don't we have proper maternity and paternity policies so that people who have families can be confident that they can combine being a really good active MP with being a really good active parent? That's not the question we're being asked, and that's a real frustration to me because it's such a missed opportunity. But nevertheless, the other MP, the Conservative MP, Alicia Kearns, who will be giving evidence, puts it quite simply. The House of Commons chamber is no place for a baby. She says she's always been able to leave the chamber to feed her daughter and does not need to have that live stream to the world. What do you think? Well, and I can hear your colleague thinks it's all about being paid. Look, let me be very clear. I took my baby in because I didn't have any maternity cover and my baby was four months old. I, I'd taken babies in previously, so I wasn't the first person to do it. And it was breastfeeding. The issue here is about being able to feed your baby and anybody who's actually got a small baby will know that it's not really practical the idea of leaving them in different places but as i say this is the wrong question to be having because it's not about whether you can take a baby into the chamber it's about why there isn't proper maternity cover you know if the place that makes the laws on what is family friendly isn't very family friendly itself you can't really be confident that it's going to fight for the families in our communities and we know that thousands of women around this country are discriminated against when it comes to maternity provision so yes in answer to your colleague I have childcare for my older child, but for my little baby at four months old, it was simpler for me to be able to go in and do the debates and do the work I needed to do whilst holding the baby. Now, that situation only came about because I didn't have someone to cover the work that needs to be done to make sure that my constituents were properly represented. And I just say to your colleague, you know, one of the challenges here is that um, if we're having a job where we're really saying to people, look, disappear for six months, nobody will notice. I don't think my constituents should accept that either. And I don't think that's really going to help us deal with what people feel about politicians is that we're all lazy. So why is it that we ask employers to have proper policies in place to make sure that parents can combine being good parents and looking after, I mean, it's a very small baby, four months old, but we don't do it ourselves. In terms of the decision for how Parliament treats new parents, our parents with young babies, mm -hmm. who will actually make the decision and do, we ha do you have a sense of when that decision will be made? 
No, I don't, Gloria. And one of the challenges in this is everyone's blaming each other, they're blaming the political parties and whether they use the pairing system. As if it's okay for me to say to my constituents, sorry, I couldn't take part in that debate and represent you because I was paired, rather than recognising that we could use electronic voting or proxy voting, all things that we used during the pandemic. And actually our democracy didn't fall apart, it thrived because people were able to combine being COVID safe, but also with their family commitments and making sure they were representing people. But right now, there are decisions that need to be made by the House authorities, there are decisions that need to be made by the parliamentary authorities, and there are decisions that need to be made by political parties. Nobody's gripping this. And I'm very struck that 10 years ago, there was an all-party inquiry into this that talked about the need to do something. 10 years later, we're no further forward. I wish I could say to women who are going into politics, this is going to get easier. I can't. That's why we set up the campaign This Mum Votes. That's why we're setting up a fund to support mums of young children to stand for selection, um, because we think that actually it needs some people from the real world to get into this and start saying, why are we saying this status quo is acceptable? You know, why are we saying that basically if you hate your family, go into politics because you're never going to see them? Stella, Creasy, one thing we can be sure of is that you will continue to campaign passionately to make your case. And thank you. We thank you for your time today. Stella Creasy, Labour MP. You have been watching The Briefing with me, Gloria DiPiero. I'm back every Monday to Thursday from noon. The show is every Monday to Friday at noon. Up next, it is On The Money with Liam Halligan. But for now, I'll leave you with your weather. Hello, a cold but largely sunny start to the working week. Much of the country dry today. We will see weather fronts eventually bringing some patchy rain to parts of the west tomorrow. But they're making slow progress, these weather fronts, up against this chunky area of high pressure, bringing, by and large, the whole of the country a dry day today. We have seen one or two showers drifting over East Anglia into the East Midlands. Still one or two around here through the early afternoon, but fizzling out. A cloudier zone over parts of northern England, north Wales, but uh, for most, dry, fine, with plenty of blue sky. There is a fairly brisk wind blowing, though, across the south. That is bringing a fairly chilly feel once more. Temperatures widely mid to high single figure, so cold for the time of year. But add on that wind and it feels quite a bit colder across much of southern England in particular. And it'll turn quite cold overnight tonight. We'll keep some cloud across the uh, east and maybe one or two showers just grazing into Cornwall. But the vast majority dry and as skies start to clear later in the night, that blue on the map is a, a frost forming, certainly across the spine of the country. A bit too much breeze to have too much frost across the east and a bit more cloud further west, keeping temperatures up here. But for many, it'll be a, a cold, frosty start to Tuesday, a windier day as well. Again, much of central and eastern England, most of Scotland looking dry and sunny, but steadily clouding over from the west with some patchy rain by the end of the day into Northern Ireland, West Wales and southwest England too. But much of the day will be dry, certainly across the east, plenty of sunshine, but um, temperatures again, only single figures here. Further west, it is turning milder, but of course you'll have the cloud and we will have some outbreaks of rain, which will just continue to trickle a little further eastwards as we go through Tuesday evening. Before that band of rain, that weather front fizzles out, there is another one waiting to push in slowly but surely as we head into Wednesday. That will bring some rain to Scotland and Northern Ireland. Much of the week there will be dry across the east. And after a cold start, things slowly turning a bit milder. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes.